raise uh, money to pay for the parsonage uh, beginning the 1st of June, I believe, I was, I'm, I'm correct. There was some money that had already been set aside for that, and uh, we looked for a goal of, of 60 million won to pay off the remaining <coughs> payment. Uh, we received a total through the year, uh, in, well, in the campaign, we received a total of just around 41 million won. That is amazing. You should thank God for that, and I think we should actually <laughs> that is an amazing amount from a small congregation. The amazing thing about it is that, I mean, there's a lot of amazing things, and I, I have been known to say that I am never surprised by what God does, but I am always amazed by what he does. We have enough money to pay for the parsonage, and sometime this month, the parsonage will belong to KNU International English Church. That's something else to, to really appreciate. Okay. Um, we've already made a, a, a payment of 50 million won to the Kims, and we'll pay the remaining amount uh, when the property closes. Okay. Um, they have also been gracious and has have actually reduced the amount that they asked for by five million more. Another thing. <laughs> See, God is so great. And if, if all of you had been part of this process like some of us have been, you would have seen so many amazing things. You have to understand that what God has done here is amazing. And he will continue to do amazing things for this church. We can depend on that. And so now I'm going to say what I've got to say. Surely the Lord is in this place. There are, are some Christian teachings that regard some basic truths that are hidden or assumed. In other words, there is no physical evidence but the primary colors of those things exist and are there for us to kind of blend together these truths into something that's understandable. One of these teachings is called the transcendence of God or the presence of God. And I've spoken of this before, but I felt today was a good time to talk about it again. Not the same sermon that I gave, but I'm going to give some other information here. The Bible tells us that God dwells in his creation and, it, and is present in all of his works. This is taught boldly in, in the Bible by the prophets, the apostles, and is generally accepted by Christian theologians. And what I mean by that is that it appears in scholarly books that are written by pastors and theologians and teachers who want to build up the body of Christ. But for some reason, this idea is not fully sunk in to many, if not most, Christians. Some teachers shy away from it because the full implication of this principle and uh, is sometimes just watered down or, or muted. People are afraid of the idea of the presence of God because it sounds too much like pantheism. But I can tell you most assuredly that God's presence has nothing to do with pantheism. Pantheism doesn't deceive people, not many people anyway. Essentially, pantheism states that God is the sum of all the created things. In other words, nature and God are one. So whoever touches a leaf or feels the sun on their face is in contact with God. 
that idea degrades the glory of God, and because the effort to make all things divine, by this effort of making all things divine, divinity is reduced to something everyday or, or mundane. The truth of the matter is that God lives in this world, but he's separate from it. He is closely identified with his work, but his works stand apart from him, and he is before and independent of them. He is transcendent above all of that, all of his works, while his, his existence is evident in his creation. Okay, how about that? So what does that mean to us as Christians? Does it mean anything? Well, it means a lot. It simply means that God is here. Wherever you are, God is there. There's no place. There's no place where he is not. Seven people, seven billion people exist on this planet, and he is near to all of them at the same time. And he is everywhere else too. God is here. There is no place closer or further away from God than any other point. No one is closer to God than anyone else. The book of Genesis begins with the words, in the beginning, God. That requires a cause. God is that cause. And there is no cause for God. He is uncaused. We must begin there. That's hard to understand. Do you remember when Adam, Adam and Eve sinned? Adam tried to hide from God. Remember? King David apparently tried to hide from God in the scripture we wrote, read today. Where shall I go from your spirit? He said. The scripture we read today is very clear that there is no place where God is not. King Solomon exclaimed that the house that he built in Jerusalem could not contain God. In fact, he said all the heavens couldn't contain him. The Apostle Paul told the Athenians on Mars Hill that God is not very far from every one of us and that in him we have our existence and move and breathe. So if God is present everywhere and there is no place where we can go that he is not, why don't we celebrate that? That's just a question that I need you to think about. In Genesis chapter 28, we find Jacob wandering in the desert, fearing for his life. Remember? Remember what Jacob did? Stole the blessing from his brother. Deceived his father with the help of his mother. And he spends a night in this place, and he has this marvelous dream. And this place was eventually called Bethel or Bethel, which means house of God. He had a dream, and, and when he woke up in the morning, he said, Surely the Lord was in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. Jacob, along with the rest of the world, never spent one moment out of the presence of God. Yet he was surprised by that presence in Bethel. He didn't know God was there. That wasn't God's problem. That was Jacob's problem. People seem to know, people seem to not know that God is here. What a difference it would be if we realized that God is present all the time. 
And I'm not talking about presents like Santa Claus. Are you familiar with Santa Claus? He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. It's not that at all. The Apostle Paul seems frustrated with people when he wrote the first chapter of Romans. In part of that chapter he said, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because, God, because he has made it obvious to them. For since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Though everything God made, through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Now there's one thing that we should understand. There's a difference between the manifestation of God's presence and God's presence. There can't be one without the other. But God is here whether we recognize it or acknowledge it or not. God's presence is manifested when we are aware of it. For that to happen, we must surrender and cooperate with him. He will show himself to us if we are open to it. That's the difference between having a boring, uninspired Christian life where we spend our time on our computers, on our phones, on our tablets, and living in the radiance of God's presence. That's the difference. And one thing that we need to understand is that God is always seeking to reveal himself to us. Always. God wants to show himself all the time. And he doesn't want to just come for a brief visit. He wants us to know that he's there all the time. Just remember that God doesn't have to travel any distance to encounter us. There's no physical distance that he has to traverse. It's not a matter of distance, it's a matter of experience. So when we speak of being close to God, we're using our, our language to, that relates to our ordinary human relationships. Debbie and I are far from our families in the United States. That's a matter of distance. But I can say, for instance, that I'm closer to my son now than when he was younger, even though he's over 10,000 kilometers away. One is a matter of distance and one is a matter of relationship. When we sing songs about being near to God, we aren't talking about God coming to a place. We're talking about the nearness of our relationship with him. We are asking for increasing degrees of awareness, I suppose, for a more perfect relationship with God. We don't have to shout across the vastness of space to encounter God. He's closer than our next breath. He's here. Here. So why do some people seem to find God, quote unquote, in a way that, that others seem to not find God? Why does God seem to reveal himself to some and not others? Does God play favorites? I'm hoping your answer there is no. He has no favorites. All he has ever done was for all of his children. And he will do everything for his children. The difference lies with us, not with God. So let's take a, a look at some of the, the saints uh, who, uh, saints of the church and, and maybe those in, in biblical times. You'll immediately see that none of them were alike. Isaiah and Moses couldn't have been more different. Elijah was nothing like David. 
Peter and Paul were at odds with one another and saw things much differently. John Wesley and Jonathan Edwards could not have disagreed more on Christian doctrine. Doesn't seem to matter. The differences are as wide as life, or life itself. Differences of race, national, national, nationality, habits, qualities, education. Yet each one of them walked a spiritual road that was uncommon. Their differences of time, space, education, nationality, habits, qualities were incidental and none of them had any significance with God. But in some way, some important way, they, they must have been alike. What was it? It was, it was like something in them was open to heaven. There was something that pushed them or urged them toward God. It, was, it seemed that they had some sort of spiritual awareness and that, that they went on to cultivate until it became the most important thing in their lives. Like all of us, they all had that inward longing that God puts in us, but they did something about it. They responded to God in a spiritual way and did their best not to hide from God as if that's possible. But being receptive to God is not a simple thing. It, it's kind of a blending of several things in our souls. It's a de desire to have or a desire, an affinity to be in the presence of God. This can be increased by exercising it or cultivating it, and it can be destroyed, be destroyed by ignoring or neglecting it. That's pretty simple. It's God's gift, but it must be recognized and cultivated to realize the power and the purpose for which it has been given. But you know, today it seems like cultivating and exercising a relationship with God is, is too slow. We look for dramatic experiences. Everything is fast today. We expect our relationship to God to be the same. We've been trying to apply information age methods to this relationship. Are we in the information age or we move beyond that? I don't know. Seems like not too many people have information. We read our chapter, we, we have a devotion and we listen to another great sermon Maybe not here, but somewhere else. All of this is valuable. It usually doesn't entail very much contact with God, does it? This leads to shallow lives, hollow philosophies, and glorification of people. You know, I appreciate people like, like Francis Chan, John Maxwell, and Max Lucado. However, if I depend on their teaching and not my relationship with Jesus, I will fail miserably. When we try to copy the life of another and try to make another experience, another person's experience our own, the waters of Christianity become muddied. I've, I've read a, a many great books by great authors, but we should not filter our lives through the experiences of others. Our lives should be a direct connection to God, practicing in His presence. It takes courage to step into the presence of God alone, but it can be done. And when we look at people who have done that, we see an incredible change in them. Books can't change us. They may help us because they might point us in the right direction. But the book itself cannot change us. God does that. I also want to tell you today that you should never feel inferior to another Christian. We all have the same opportunity to be in God's presence. We, we make that choice ourselves. Sometimes it's easier to try to, to try to hide from God. 
However, we know we can't do that. But we can only grow closer to God in relationship, not distance. If we earnestly turn to God, he will show himself. I can guarantee that. You will be delighted by what you find there. It's not always easy, but it's definitely worth it. We need to break the mold in which the world has expected us to conform. The presence of God is here. The whole universe is alive with this presence. And he's not a stranger to us. We know almost instinctively about him. He's the father of Jesus Christ who has loved us from the very beginning of the world. And even though man has encased himself in sin, he still seeks that relationship. God still seeks the relationship. He is always trying to get our attention to communicate with us. He is always trying to reveal himself. He is pursuing us in a precious way. This world is full of amazing things. I mean, I mean, look at it. Really, look at it. It's also full of tragedy and sorrow. And we know that too. But when we realize that God will respond to our pursuit of Him, we have in us the ability to know. I want to say it again. God, the universal presence, is a fact. God is here. The whole universe is alive with His life. And He's no strange God or a foreign God. But the Father of, our, our, of Jesus Christ, who's loved us for thousands of years, even though we're full of sin. And he's always trying to get our attention, to reveal himself, to communicate. We have within us the ability to know the kingdom of heaven if we just respond. Lisa Beamer, Lisa Beamer's, Beamer's father, Todd, was one of the people on Flight 93 that crashed in Pennsylvania on September 11, 2001. Her father and some others stopped that plane from crashing somewhere in Washington, D.C. He, he and everybody else on the airplane died, but his daughter wrote a book called Let's Roll. Because that was the last words that she heard that her father uh, said before he and a group of men tried to take the plane back from the hijackers. And she wrote, slowly I began to understand that the plans God had for us don't just include good things, but the whole array of human events. The prospering he talks about in the book of Jeremiah is often the outcome of a bad event. I remember my mom saying that many People look for miracles, things that in their human minds fix a difficult situation. Many miracles, however, are not a change to the normal course of human events. They're found in God's ability to desire and desire to sustain and nurture people even through the worst situations. Somewhere along the way, I stopped demanding that God fix the problem in my life and started being thankful for his presence as I endured them." Unquote. It's not rocket science and it's not brain surgery. It's not complicated. We make it that way. God is here. He wants you. You need him. That's a great combination. Let's pray. Father, you are a great God, thank you for his, your presence. Thank you for the ability for us to know that, Father. Thank you for your scripture that points us in that direction. But thank you, Father, most of all, for what you've done to us in this life, done for us in this life. We thank you 
for your love, your grace, and the gift of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen.